Throughout history, people have been killing each other in droves over resources, from gold, land and spices to oil and microchips. In this video, we'll find out why this seemingly insignificant item is so important to every country on the planet and how it might spark the World War 3. The possibility of a technology war has been brewing for quite some time now. Maybe you haven't been paying attention, but the foundation for these deadly wars has already been laid. Every device you own, be it a phone or a laptop, is tainted with invisible blood stains. The production of these devices has caused pain and suffering somewhere down the line, and the situation is only getting worse. The US is doing everything to ensure China doesn't get ahead in the race to acquire the most advanced semiconductor chips. Because chips are the things that are worth fighting for. They are typically crafted from silicon, which is obtained from silica found in sand. Unlike other conflict minerals such as lithium and cobalt, sand is widely available in almost every corner of the planet. But it's not the sand that's creating the problem. It's the ability to make these chips and make enough of them for all you consumers and most importantly, the military. If you were to pull apart that phone in your hand, besides the battery and other mineral components, you'll also come across the microchip. A tiny bit of semiconductor material that houses an electronic circuit. And these chips are everywhere iPhones, AC units, smart doorbells, computers, cars, Rafael fighter jets, and even ISRO's Chandrayaan. Semiconductor chips are the new oil in the 21st century. At present, approximately 72% of the world's microchips are produced in Asia, with the leading nations being Taiwan, South Korea, China, and Japan. In particular, Taiwanese companies are responsible for manufacturing 63% of all the chips and a staggering 92% of the most advanced ones. But things weren't always like this. In the 1950s, computers were starting to gain prominence, but they were still bulky machines with numerous wires connecting various components together, which were very inefficient. It was during this time that two American engineers had a revolutionary idea to replace the wires with a new technology called a transistor. Transistors are precise, reliable on and off switches that could control the flow of electricity with great accuracy. Initially, the transistors were large and bulky, just like the wires they were meant to replace. However, the engineers realized that by carving these switches onto a piece of silicon, they could create a single circuit that could fit more components into one place, making the machine smaller and more efficient. Back in the 1950s, US engineers created this, the very first semiconductor chip, a piece of silicon with four transistors on it. The more transistors, the more powerful the chip. And by 1960, engineers had already managed to quadruple that number. Every year, these folks figured out ways to keep adding more. And suddenly, the US was swept by a new gold rush. The rush was to cram as many of these tiny switches onto the silicon chip as possible, thereby enabling technology to do even more sophisticated things. Much of this activity was taking place in Central California, in a valley that would soon come to be known as Silicon Valley. In 1965, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, made a prediction that the computing power generated by a single chip would double every year or so. And this prediction, known as Moore's Law, has largely held true until the present day. By the mid-1980s, experts were squeezing nearly 300,000 transistors on a single piece of silicon. To give you some perspective, take a look at this graph, which shows the number of transistors on a piece of silicon. By 2010, experts were able to pack a billion transistors on a piece of silicon, the size of your fingernail. The only way to achieve this was by making each transistor insanely small. Let's take a moment to marvel at this fact. This chip right here has around 114 billion transistors on it. Remember that back in 1960, chips had just 4 transistors. It's hard to imagine how tiny each transistor could be. They are getting so small that using human hair as a comparison just doesn't cut it anymore. We are talking about scales that are almost unimaginable, like smaller than a red blood cell, smaller than even a virus. We are talking nanometers. And get this, IBM recently showed off a chip with transistors that are only 2 nanometers thick, which is smaller than a strand of DNA. Can you even wrap your head around that? It's mind-boggling. Cramming billions of transistors onto a small piece of silicon is a difficult task. And as the number of transistors continues to increase, it becomes incredibly complicated. And initially, the US chip companies handled the entire supply chain, from designing and manufacturing the chips to assembling them into a product, all within the US. However, by the late 1960s, they realized that they could make a lot more profits by designing chips for civilian products, but had to make a lot more of them and a lot less expensive. 
So many of these companies outsourced their manufacturing to countries where labor was cheaper, such as Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and Hong Kong. The U.S. government encouraged this, but at the same time, it banned them from sharing this technology with its rivals, China and Soviet Union. In the 90s, a Taiwanese company named TSMC got so good at making chips that many U.S. companies stopped manufacturing them altogether. Remember this name because TSMC is at the center of the conflict between the U.S. and China. TSMC was basically owned by the Taiwanese government from the beginning, and it solved the America's problem of producing these super complicated microchips, eventually making them reliant on Taiwan. It's like they became the new tech dealer on the block. Since the U.S. was heavily reliant on TSMC, Taiwan got itself a silicon shield to protect itself from its big aggressive neighbor, China, which sees Taiwan as a breakaway province and has vowed to reunite with mainland China. But the downside was that every country's chip industry was increasingly dependent on other countries for the materials, software, and equipment required to make more advanced chips. By the mid 90s, the US had become friendlier with China after the end of the Cold War, and the US lifted most of its export controls. China seized this opportunity and attracted many chip-making companies to move their assembly operations to China. As a result, by the 2000s, China had become dominant at this end of the supply chain. However, China found itself in a tricky position as it became increasingly reliant on imported chips to fuel its own assembly industry. The Chinese government analyzed the tech supply chain and realized that the entire Chinese tech ecosystem was built on a foundation of imported silicon from its geopolitical rivals such as the Japan, US, and Taiwan. As a result, the Chinese government started pouring money into its own chip design and manufacturing companies. which then partnered with non-chinese firms on the hopes of creating a chip supply chain that existed entirely within china soon china was able to design manufacture and assemble some older generations of chips but was still years behind the us in making the most cutting edge chips the problem is this supply chain for advanced chips is concentrated within a few companies worldwide and none of them are in china first there are only 3 american companies that can make the software needed to design the advanced chips Then you will need a high-tech US laser machine to bring these designs to life which is only made by one company in the Netherlands called ASML. And that machine needs equipment that's only made in the US. And on top of that the metals and chemicals needed for the chips come from companies in Japan. And finally only companies in Taiwan and South Korea can put it all together and manufacture the most advanced processor chips. As you can see these companies are choke points in the entire supply chain but it turns out that the US is still the big boss of the whole ecosystem. And then you have China, who's a giant customer in all of these. But why do they care so much about getting their hands on these chips? Well, it's not just about having the latest and coolest gadgets. Nope, China needs these chips to beef up their military might with super advanced warships, satellites, missiles, drones, and AI. Since China wanted to eventually decrease its reliance on the foreign supply chain, It started identifying these choke points like ASML and copied them by stealing their technology. However, the plan backfired. This angered the US government who took this issue with China's subsidies and saw it as a national security concern rather than just an economic one. The Trump administration banned US companies from selling components to ZTE in 2018 and banned US companies from doing business with Huawei and its affiliates in 2019. These bans nearly bankrupted ZTE and dealt a big blow to Huawei. The next president Joe Biden continued to target China's chip industry in 2022 by banning all US companies from selling advanced chips to China, blocking China's design companies from using US made software and equipment, and preventing global companies that use US semiconductor technology from selling advanced chips to China. These actions were targeted to exploit the choke points in the supply chain and crush China's chip industry. Next the US government passed the Chips Act a bill that would pump billions of dollars into domestic chip manufacturing to offset the economic impact of cutting off China's access to US made chips The act aims to bring back chip manufacturing facilities to the US with companies like Intel being major recipients of the funds About 50 billion dollars will go to companies like Intel which is now opening a new fab in Ohio They also finalized a deal with Taiwan's biggest manufacturer TSMC to build manufacturing plants in the US all to enable the US to keep racing ahead. And India has also sensed an opportunity in the midst of this semiconductor supply chain crisis and it is taking steps to be a part of it. The government has introduced a production linked incentive scheme worth 76000 crores to encourage chip manufacturers to set up fabs within India. 
subsidizing the costs of semiconductor plant setup and offering a 4 to 6% incentive on net sales for the next 5 years. Companies like Tata Group, Vedanta Foxconn Joint Venture and IGSS Ventures have expressed interest in entering the semiconductor manufacturing space as a result of this scheme. However, given the complexity and high chance of failure in semiconductor technology, there is a risk of significant loss. To mitigate this, India could focus on other aspects of the semiconductor supply chain such as design, assembling, packaging and testing, which also have the potential to generate investment and create jobs. Although for now, India's focus is on semiconductor manufacturing. As you can see, chips are the things that are worth fighting for because they are not just some boring computer component, they are basically the key to the future. Chips mean money, innovation and fancy new gadgets, sure, but they also mean new sophisticated weapons. Yes, chips are the new weapon of choice for countries looking to flex their geopolitical muscles. It's like the new oil, except instead of crude, it's just a bunch of silicon wafers with tiny switches on them. And this has created a complicated dynamic between the US, China and Taiwan. China has long considered Taiwan as a part of its territory and has threatened to use force to reunify with it. On the other hand, the US has promised to defend Taiwan against any aggression from China, like it promised to Ukraine, except the situation is different. The situation is further complicated by the fact that Taiwan is home to some of the most critical choke points in the chip supply chain. Taiwanese companies produce more than half of all the chips worldwide and about 92% of all the advanced chips. As a result, these companies have become indispensable to both the US and Chinese chip industries, which has given Taiwan some protection. Going forward, the real power will boil down to not those with the most nuclear weapons, but to those with the best chips. So far, the US is doing everything it can to limit China's access to the most advanced chips and China is doing everything it can to catch up. All in all, Cold War vibes are back and we hope these superpowers only remain on the edge of a hot war just like the big nuclear powers do. China will want to strike back at the US without actually provoking a military response, like the recent spy balloon incident. It's like when your annoying little sibling pokes you and you want to poke them back without getting in trouble with your parents. Who knows what's going to happen next, but one thing's for sure, this fight over chips is not going to go away anytime soon.